So our warm-up problem, our review, we have two functions, f of x and g of x, and they're shown below. And then we're asked to find the limit as x approaches 3 minus, now that doesn't mean x approaches negative 3, it means x approaches 3 from the left-hand side of g of f of x. Okay, and we have some options. 1, 2, 3, 4, or the limit does not exist. What's the answer? Did anyone find an answer? Very timid answer. Is it C? Is it C? No, but it's a good guess. Is it A? Is it A? That seems almost too obvious. And it is. It is A. Because what's happening? As x is approaching 3 from below, this is the part we care about because we're looking on the inside. As you're approaching 3 from below, the function is always 2. So that says, hey, as we're approaching 3 from below, it always looks like g of 2. And g of 2 is 1. And there's the answer. Now, good times, right? Good times. Okay. Now, our thought for today. And I, I don't know who originally said this, but I, I know who said it to me. It was a professor I had when I was a, a young mathling, not much, actually really close to your age. And uh, it was advice for how to do well in math, and, but just advice on how to do well in, in school in general. And it goes like this. Try something. If that doesn't work, then try something else. But never give up. There was an old show that was on back when I was uh, a middle school student. I'm sure it's been off the air for years. It was called The Simpsons. And, and on this show, there was uh, one character, not a main character, who made the statement, we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. That's a bad way to go about things. You should try things. And it's OK to try things and say, it probably won't work. It might work, and then you'll be really pleasantly surprised. But trying things and saying, OK, it didn't work, but why didn't it work? And understanding that will help you so that the next time you try it, it's be even more likely to succeed. So it's far better to try things and fail than to just sit on your hands and do nothing. It's the learning happens through trial and error. So keep trying things. Keep going. All right. Well, on to today's topic. We're going to talk about sort of an important notion, which is, uh, for lack of a better word, nice functions. Now you might say, well, what makes a function nice? Well, there's lots of things that can make a, a function nice, but we're going to talk about one very particular property, and that's going to be what we call continuous, or continuity. So we'll focus first on at a point. And I'll write down the definition, and then I'll, I'll write down what I really mean. So the formal definition... So continuity at a point x equals a means that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f of a. So that's continuity. And at this point, you're like, oh my gosh, that seems really complicated. Can't you make it simpler? Yes. Let's think about what limits represent. What are limits telling us? Do you remember... When we discussed about limits, the goal of a limit is a, a limit tells you what should happen. should happen. Oh, good. I was like, oh, do, do I need to do like some hangman action? But good, I, I, I can say that for later in the semester. So this is what should happen at, well, in particular, for f of x at x equals a. So in other words, we say, here is the function and this is telling you what the function 
should do at x equals a. Now this equal sign is very fancily translated to the word is. All right. Now this right hand side, f of a. So what is f of a? So if this left hand side is what should happen, what is f of a? What actually happens? So this is what actually happens. for f of x, whoops, for f of x at x equals a. So what makes a function continuous is that what should happen is what actually happens. Or as I like to put it, there's no surprises. What we think should be true is true. So no surprises. Ah. Okay, all right. So. All right, now that's continuous at a point. You can talk about that notion of continuous functions. And we can say a function is continuous if it's continuous everywhere. Okay, so that's today. We want to talk about notions of continuity. So, it's actually not so bad. This will be a nice day, a nice, nice sort of cool, refreshing day. So let's talk about what might go wrong. So continuity, what should happen is what actually happens. What are some things that could go wrong? Yeah, there's a couple of things, right? So, so if you think about it, there's sort of three pieces here. So we need to have three things happen. One, the limit has to exist. Two, f of a has to be defined. So if it's not defined, it can't be continuous. And then the third thing that has to happen is that one and two have to match. So depending upon our, our graph, things can break down. So let's, let's do some pictures to say, here are some things that might happen. So, and we'll mark a point A. So we are, we're drawing. Is the function continuous at A? And if it's not continuous, what's the issue? Comes with piecewise at A? Well, it's piecewise, but being piecewise by itself is not enough to say I'm not continuous. So piecewise, oftentimes when things are not continuous, it's because of piecewise. But piecewise is okay, it's just what has to be true. I think there may be another hand. Yes? The limit doesn't exist at A. Why doesn't the limit exist at A? Because uh, from the left and the right hand side. So yeah, we can just see. As we come in from the two sides, I'm approaching two different values. I'm being told two different things depending upon whether I come in from the left or the right. So the pieces don't line up. So I'm just going to make a note following up on what we said about piecewise. Uh, piecewise. Functions can be continuous if the pieces line up. Now, I, I have, have, didn't mention this, but sometimes people talk about continuity. They say, oh, continuous functions are functions where you don't have to lift the pen or you don't have to lift the pencil. And uh, that's actually not a bad way to think about it because essentially, Continuous functions are, you don't have to. What you think should happen is happens. And here, well, the limit doesn't exist. So this is an example. This actually has a, a name for it. So this is called a jump discontinuity. And uh, you will need to remember this name, jump. And what's the idea is our function is jumping. 
So how do you know you have a jump discontinuity? You say that the limit from the two sides do not match. So if the left hand versus the right hand are telling you, hey, you get two different answers, then that's a jump discontinuity. Now, I, I don't know what the textbook says. I probably should at some point actually open the textbook. But I'm going to also assume that these are numbers. So we're not going to deal with things blowing up. That's, that's for another day. OK, so this is sort of a problem breaks down for number one. All right. So that's one type of discontinuity. Now, another type of discontinuity, let's draw it here. And uh, do, 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 do. things are going wrong. Da, ba, da, ba, da. OK. Here's another dis discontinuity. What's wrong here, as it's currently drawn? F of A isn't defined. Right? I, I didn't mark that this is at A, but this is a case where F of A isn't defined. So that's something that could be wrong. Now, I could modify this picture slightly. I'll use a, a different color. It's like, oh, maybe I, I define it so it's up here. So now f of a is defined. Is it continuous? Why not? <coughs> yeah, so the, the problem is that you're expecting it to be where this circle is. It doesn't match. So this is another type of discontinuity that has an important name. So this is called a removable discontinuity. Again, know your names. These are the two main ones, removable and jump. So what is the characteristic here? Here, the limit as you approach A of f of x exists, but either f of A is not defined, or f of A does not equal the limit. Now, the name removable discontinuity is very suggestive about something. What does removable imply? That you can remove it. How could one remove a removable discontinuity? Yes? Could you like move the line or something? Well, what do we want to move? Do we want to move the... We can move. What, what should be moved? You said move the line. Either the, the like previous or like the already existing line or the dot. Well, I would say move the dot. So that's... You can redefine the function. There's... Uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember. I, I want to say it's Happy Gilmore. There's an Adam Sandler movie where he, he plays a, uh, a hockey player who turns into a golfer, and he's like yelling at the ball, go in the hole, the hole is your home, you should go in the, you know, he's very upset at this ball. But that's essentially what it is. It's like, that's where you need to go. You need to go into that hole. You need to fill that hole. Because then, then everything's okay. So the way we, we fix it, so to remove, We define, or we redefine, depending upon what's happening, the function at x equals a. And so we def define or redefine it just so that everything lines up and we no longer have any issues. So that's how we remove a removable discontinuity. Now those are the two main ones. Can other things happen? Yes. And, but basically, you should think of it as, I have a jump, I have a removable, or something else. And so, 
So if it's not jump or removable, it's just like something else. Uh, are, are, does that satisfy you, or do I want to give you examples of things that can go wrong in other ways? Okay, I think we're good here. All right. Cool. So, let's see. What can we do? All right. Yeah, we can do things. So, any questions on continuity before we start working through some examples? Uh, is a function with like a vertical asymptote continuous? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Is a function with a vertical asymptote continuous? We are going to talk about asymptotes on our next lecture. And no. Uh, so, the, so the issue, if you go back to the, like, can I lift my pen? You know, the problem is with vertical asymptote, you can't, you have to lift your pen up. Or pencil, you know, we, we, we don't judge you. Uh, but, but you can't draw in one continuous thing. And uh, so, so, no, vertical asymptotes are, are not continuous. And, yeah, things with infinity get weird as you'll discover as we go on. Infinity is a very strange thing. Okay, so this is one we'll, we'll do together. All right. Suppose that f of x is as shown in the figure below. And then there's a series of questions here. So we'll start with question number one. For which values of a between 0 and 4 does the limit as x approach a f of x not exist? So where does the limit not exist? Okay, I've, I've heard lots of murmuring of, of one. Are we, do we all agree on one? Yes. So at, uh, for which values of a, at a equals one. Now, why? Because we can see that at 1, if we come in from the left hand, it looks like we should get negative 2. But if we come in from the right hand, it looks like we should get 1. Those don't match. So remember, if we have limits, it shouldn't matter which side I come from. From the left or from the right, they should align. So if you get different answers, then it's not, uh, the limit doesn't exist. It doesn't converge. What about 3? Three? 3 looks very tempting. Does the limit exist at 3? Yes. What is the limit at 3? It's 2. So the limit does exist here because from both sides we're agreeing. However, that doesn't mean that everything is going well at that point. So for, for question number 1, just at a equals 1. And in particular, what does that tell you in terms of continuity at the point 1? So yeah, so we see this is a jump discontinuity. So that's not part of the question, but we can see that this is a, oh boy, can I spell particular? No. Uh, well, but I can spell jump. There we go, jump. <laughs> All right. Good, good. Thank goodness I don't teach English. Okay, jump. Now, question two. Uh, how should the function be modified to delete a removable discontinuity? Now, to delete a discontinuity says remove it. Now, is there a re removable discontinuity? Where is it? At three. Three is removable because the limit does exist, but surprise! The limit doesn't match the value of the function. OK. So how should the function be modified? So what do we do? We need to move the function so that at 3, it needs to be redefined. So the punchline is, here is redefine the function at at x equals 3, so that f of 3 equals, and what do we put down here? 2. And if we do that, we've patched the hole. That's now gone. Life is good. So even though 
you can see that these aren't the exact same function on the left and right. It's piecewise. They lined up, and life is good. The patch worked. OK, number three. So notice that we said at 1, we have a jump discontinuity. Is the function x minus 1 f of x continuous at x equals 1? Justify your answer. So is this function continuous at x equal 1? So we can, we can call this x minus 1 times f of x, we can give it a name. We can call it like g of x. How do we know if something is continuous at a point? We check, right, the definition. Limit as x approaches 1 of g of x. And then we say, well, what is g of 1? And we just compare these answers. Which one is easy to compute? Or which one is intuitive to compute? Do you want to do the limit, or do you want to just plug it in? Probably plug it in is pretty simple, right? So g of 1, according to the rule, is 1 minus 1 times f of 1. 1 minus 1 times f of 1. What is f of 1? 2. two. 0 times 2, also known as? Zero. 0. OK, so g of 1 should be 0. Well, what does the limit say? Well, it's the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus 1 times f of x. What's happening to things? Well, f of x is not nice because if there's a jump discontinuity. That limit doesn't exist. But what about x minus 1? What's happening to this? What's happening to x minus 1? If x is close to 1, what's true about x minus 1? It's getting closer to 0. It's getting, closer to zero. It's, it's getting small. What about f of x? Well, it's not approaching a value, but it's not getting big. I know, you're like, wow, this is very mathematicians. It's small and not big. OK. What's our conclusion? And what, what tool are we using to make that conclusion? What's the tool? I think that's the right number of letters. We'll find, what? S. What? Squeeze, okay, all right. <laughs> See, I knew there were enough letters. It's squeeze. Wait, is that how you spell squeeze? It looks wrong all of a sudden. But OK, all right, good. So you know what it is. So if you have something small, this is small. This is not big. So what's the whole thing going to do? It's going to be small. It's going to be squeezed. So this is going to go to 0. So what's the conclusion? Is the function continuous? Yeah, so the function is continuous. So you, there are ways to remove jump discontinuities if we put the squeeze on. There's other ways to do it, too, by combining with other functions. All right. Cool. Any questions? Oh, I see a question. Yeah. Um, no worries. So for two, I mean, I understand what you wrote. But right. How do you just move the dot to? Well, that's what you do here. Re you, you, you redefine the function. So you should say set f of 3 equal to. That's this part right here. That's what moving the dot is. So currently, the dot, the way the function is defined, f of 3 equals negative 1. So you'll, you'll see, when we talk about piecewise functions, you'll see something like f of x equals, and then there's a big long list. And there's stuff coming here, and there's stuff coming here. And then I'll say, oh, it's equal to negative 1 at x equals 3. So, so there's, there's a whole lots of things happening. And then when you say, oh, what you should do is the function was wrong here. We're going to redefine it so that it's no longer negative 1. 
it's now two. So that's what's happening, is you're redefining the function at that point. And so the way we write it is redefine the function at x equals three so that f of three equals two. Okay, so you just change it. And yes. No, like, you, just, you just do it, there's no like requirement. I know, isn't it great? It's like, be like yeah. yeah. Write it the way it's like, I just, yeah, whoever wrote it, wrote it badly. We're gonna write it betterly, goodly. Goodly? No, that doesn't sound right. Anything else? I, I think I see a question. Yes? Uh, can you please explain why uh, at 3 uh, there's a limit just while at 1 there's not a limit? Well, so at 3, as we come in from both sides, we're just saying, what's the function approaching? So as I come in from the right, it's approaching 2. As I come in from the left, I'm approaching 2. So I'm like, yeah, it's going to 2. So the limit exists because the left and right behaviors say, hey, this looks like it should be 2. But now over at 1, as I come in from the left, it's saying, oh, I think you should be negative 2. But from the right, it says, whoa, hold your horses there, my friend. That should be a 1. Like, no, it should be negative 2. No, no, it really should be 1. And like, they're disagreeing. And if there's disagreement, it doesn't exist. So it's because you get different answers from the two sides. If you get different answers from the two sides, limit doesn't exist. So, so the punchline is, if you want to have a piecewise function be continuous, you got to line your pieces up so that everything hooks up. All right? So if you want something piecewise to be continuous, make sure everything gets lined up. Speaking of that, let's look at this problem. Oh, it's a piecewise function. And the problem asks, find A and B so that f of x is a continuous function. Now, it's, the pieces are, it looks like a piece of a parabola, 3x squared. If you're below negative 1, it looks like a piece of a straight line, ax plus b. If you're between negative 1 and positive 1, and then it looks like a different parabola, 4x squared plus 1, if you're above 1. So you need to find A and B. A equals 1, B equals 4. Sounds good to me. All right, good. So what's going on here? So the, the punchline is we have three pieces. And we say, all right, look. The individual pieces are nice because the individual pieces are polynomials. And polynomials, we like polynomials. They're some of our, our best friends are polynomials. So the only places where we're worried about is where we're gluing things together. And where does the gluing happen? Well, that's where negative 1 and positive 1. That's where we're gluing things. So we say, OK, those are the only two places where we have to worry about things lining up. And so we just say, well, we just need to make sure that the left and right limits at those two points agree. So for negative 1, we get that the left limit is 3. The right limit is negative a plus b. At positive 1, the left limit is a plus b. The right limit is 5. That gives us two equations, two unknowns we can solve for A and B. Now, there is a subtlety here, and I don't know if I've said this yet, uh, but I want to say it now. Let's suppose for a second, I just want to draw your eye to this piece here. Let's suppose I'm approaching one from below of f of x. So I'm saying, all right, what is the function doing below one? You'll notice that the function has several different definitions depending upon which part we're in. Why is it that I wrote down ax plus b? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so those are all the values from negative 1 to 1. That's how the function behaves. And, and in particular, why, in a similar way, as a follow-up question to you, 
why do we ignore the three x squared? Because that's also below one, right? Because this is saying I want to look at below one. Being below negative one is also below one. So, so you are correct. And I just want to just emphasize you have the right intuition. And, and actually, you've, you've said it very, very well. But I just want to say, why did we not go with the 3x squared? Because the 3x, I don't know if this is right, but the, the, the 3x squared is the part that it, it goes to negative 1. But then once you get to negative 1, it starts acting like using ax plus b, right? Right. From negative 1 to 1. Right. Yeah. So the thing is, you're, you're, you're doing it right. You're doing a wonderful job. I, I don't want you to. You know, I, I make people nervous. I'm very good at it. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I'm very good at making people nervous. And so you have the right answer, and I like this. The, the, the moral here is when I'm looking at what happens below 1, I'm looking at what happens just below 1, like right next to 1. And as you mentioned, it's between negative 1 and 1. It's behaving like ax plus b. This 3x squared, that's happening far away. I don't care about that. I only care about what's happening nearby. And uh, another thing we should point out is that limits are usually very easy to take. And we'll, we'll bring this up again in just a second. You just plug it in. And if you don't get 0 over 0, you're done. That's, that's the moral limits. You plug it in, and you see what you get. If you don't get 0 over 0, life is good. So you have a graph, y equals f of x, shown below. And you're asked two questions. Find and classify as removable jump or others the discontinuities of f of x on the interval from negative 4 to 4. Justify your answers with appropriate limit computations. And then B, find and classify as removable jump or other the discontinuities of f of x squared on the interval from negative 4 to 4. Justify your answers using appropriate limit computations. Are there any points that jump out to us as being issue points? Negative 1 seems to have an issue. x equals 2 seems to have an issue. Negative 1. Is this removable jump or something else? Good. Two? Good. What about f of x squared? Oh, I see somebody who's raised hand, very, very tall, waving the back in the blue shirt. Um, at uh, x equals 2, I think that um, isn't a discontinuity anymore. Ooh. Um, and so it's going to be a discontinuity anymore. Ooh, it's gone away, you think. Huh. What about. Negative one, is that a discontinuity? Yes. So, the punchline. Negative one is a jump discontinuity for the original function. The justification is the left and right hand limits don't agree. It becomes removable because the left and right hand limit agrees when you square, but the function when you square doesn't match what the limits are. 2 is removable in the original function, but it's not even a discontinuity in the square of the function because no surprises. When you square negative 1, it's the same thing as squaring positive 1. So yes. Good. See? You guys, you're ready for the exam. Good. Well, you know, there's still other stuff for us to talk about, but, you know, this problem, right? We could do that problem. All right. Uh, two other quick ideas. Before we do this, I want to mention a couple of things. So, this looks bad, but we can do it quickly. But how can we do it quickly? So the idea is that you can combine continuous functions and make continuous function. So how can we combine things? Well, the answer is there's a few basic things that you, we like to do with functions. So we can scale. So in other words, we can take k times f of x. We can add. We can take f of x plus g of x. Uh, 
we can compose, which is we put one function inside of another. Now, all of these operations, if you start with a continuous function, the result is a continuous function. These all result in continuous functions. So assuming you start with a continuous function. Function, if we start with continuous functions. Now there's one more thing we might want to do. And the last thing we might want to do is to divide. Now division, there's a little bit of a catch. What's our catch? We're continuous as long as what? Or we could say we're continuous when, what's true? Yeah, continuous where g of x is non-zero. Now what happens if g of x is zero? Well, it turns out that there's two options. If g of x is zero and f of x is non-zero at a point, then you're done, you're just hopeless. It, it's blowing up. But if the top is zero and the bottom is zero, then more work, more work. exactly, okay. Now, What's this have to do with that? Well, remember, what's true about a continuous function and a limit? If our function is continuous, then what's the answer for the limit? What's the definition of being continuous? It's h of a. So, we just look at this and we just sort of start doing off. That's continuous inside. E to the x squared is continuous. Adding 23 makes it continuous. Sine of that is continuous. You know, x to the fifth is continuous. Arc tangent of x. Oh, what a lovely function. We're going to have a good relationship with arc tangent of x. If you're sticking around with me for a couple semesters, you're going to know me and arc tangent x, we're like BFFs. So. Just to let you know what you have to look forward to. But okay, sine is continuous, cosine of sine is continuous. See, all these pieces are continuous. And same with the downstairs, these are all continuous pieces. So if I want to take the limit, what do I do? Yeah, so the answer is you just plug in two. That's it. So it's sine of e to the fourth plus 23 plus 32, which is two to the fifth, arc tangent of two. Arc tangent of two, also known as? Our tangent of 2, very good. And uh, 16 plus 5 plus sine squared of e squared plus e to the negative 2 plus log of 2 squared plus 1. And you're done. So this goes back to the moral of the story is when you have something in a limit, plug in it in first. And unless you have something happening with the denominator, life is good. Life, life, is, that's the answer, that's it. I know you're disappointed, but now. In the notes, there is a, a discussion about the intermediate value theorem. We're not gonna really rely on that. So let's finish up with our last multiple choice for the day. So consider the following piecewise function, f of x, looks like a line ax minus 2 if you're below 2, x squared plus 2x plus b over x minus 2 if you're above 2. For which value of a is it possible for this function to be continuous at x equals 2? So in other words, how can I pick a so there's even a chance, even just a chance for continuity? So should a be 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4? So the answer is e. Now, in case you're running away, what? What's our problem? Plug in two there, what happens? Zero, which means, uh-oh, we better have more work. So the only way we can have more work is if the numerator is zero, which tells us b has to equal negative eight, which tells us that really this limit has to turn out to be six. So then we say, ah, on the other hand, this limit over here, 2a minus 2, better equal 6. 
The only way that's possible is if A equals 4. All these fun problems. Good times. All right, that's it for today, and we'll see you back next time.